You know, I don't think this has a clicker. It might just be the so, keyboard. Which he can just, you know, click on the big one and uh, that will, or okay. he can hit space bar. Okay, now how do I go back? Uh, arrow keys. Okay, cool. All right, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, perfect. That's all. Yeah, That's all just, we need. I would just say just use space bar on yep. there because I don't think we have a clicker. Gotcha. And then where where's the wait, 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 backspace again? What'd you do? Uh, the back arrow, the arrow keys. These? Yeah. Gotcha. So and you can actually go forward and back okay. with arrow keys. Okay. Um, as well. But. Good. We're good. We're golden. Thank you, William. Cool. It's still so weird to see the back of my head just. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. The only thing I really don't I mean, like about this. Hmm? I'm saying for you. I agree about telling myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I gotcha. I gotcha. I still don't like how these cables are. But I don't, no, don't think... worry about them now. Because <laughs> you don't need to worry about them. Mm -hmm. We'll get them. I just don't think there's anything I can do about them is the, is the problem. Keep the door shut. Don't yeah. do it. There. Sort of. I keep pushing these cables back and they keep moving. I wonder if someone else is like digging around back here. I trying don't to know. Out stuff. I mean, it's like, yeah. Because they're like, oh, I wonder, you know, wonder why it's not working instead of calling me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Maybe that's the first thing they try is like, mm. yeah.
filling in for the resident class. Well, I will let you explain it. Are you your name again? Alexis. Hi, I'm Tanya. I see you. Too. Nice to see you. And they did not include dress ranch dressing, so I brought this down. Great. Here's plates y'all can use and here's extra napkins. Awesome. So you know, let everybody know what they can do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Water, take yourself. Awesome. Yeah, we need some cool and see Sam first. Already. What are you working on? Oh, my other job. Other job? Mm -hmm. Well, what is it? I work at this information. Oh, very cool. Hey! Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm going to stop each one and ask you your name. Alexis, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And Brandon. Brandon. Yes, okay. ma'am. Brandon, I was telling Alexis they forgot to include the sauces, so you can grab a plate. You're awesome. Dancing. Thank you. <laughs> Go to the class. I'm going to try to catch up for Bob.
Um, so I'm just telling Alexis and Brandon, we got your discovery stuff that you get lunch here too, and then we got your food sauces, so there's plates, we see. That's not cool. Ranch. <laughs> that's not cool. That's the best thing about Slims. I know. Well, at least we had a backup plan. Now. Hey, uh, what's the what's the advancing mojo here? Just hit the space bar. Yep. All right. Awesome. All righty. Tanya, thank you. And then do we just bag up the just yeah the just lunch? Trash is here. Just throw one. All right. All right. I think you guys have everything water. And if you just want to communicate that. I'm going to try to catch everyone that is in place. Should. Or, well, I have 20 boxes. This is your version of the reaction. I don't know how many residents are there. 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good. So we'll fight over the last two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's five scripts in each box, so. That was just wrong. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to catch people. I'm going to cheat today. Okay. Name cards. Name cards. Nice. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I don't. Well, this is my like first you. interaction with y'all other than I've met a few in the park. Sure. Classroom format, or do we want to rearrange into square format, which would also require us to reconfigure into classroom format? It's a big decision. I can't say I know. Do you want to this one or another? Do you want to hide your eyes? That's a tough question. No, you're good. Lunches are here. Yeah, yes, sir. We have to fill out a name tent. All right. To help me, yeah. here's a marker. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Brandon, where yes. are you from? So, oh wow. Cookie? Yeah, cookie and chips instead of fries. Chips, yeah, and no sauce. Okay. <laughs> um, from here, born and raised, went yes. to Mosaic from 8 through 12. Left to Dallas, Texas to go to Dallas Baptist University for four years. Is that the one in the World Series? Yeah. Look, where they, they didn't make it. We didn't make it. We did. We did. Uh, very good. Isaiah. I've never met before. Isaiah. Isaac. 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 There's a marker floating around. Y'all grab a lunch and make it a name. Tim. Hey, what's up? Uh, that will help me with everybody's name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you're our other FSM guy? Yes. You're, you're preaching Hebrews chapter 12? I am. Don't mess that half the time. It's made it 2,000 years. It's made it 2,000 years. Made it 2000 years. I heard Sider brought the thunder on Sunday in yeah. FSM. All right, so y'all get you a lunch and then help me out by making your name on one of these little things. What is this? It's like 8.5, man. I'm thinking about that. That's so soft. Ask Isaiah. Isaiah. I'm weird. I draw a pen out because I knew there would be a pen. What are you doing? You have all this card. Like, I'm going to get an exhaust bin. Did you have it with a blue and a cannon cut? I did. We talked about it. 
Yeah, that's it. The first time I, the first time I met Isaac was that one day you guys all came up. Oh, come on, it's in beer. Oh, yeah, you were doing it. I think you were better. No, this. I love your outfit. It's shorts. No. Hey, Brandon. What? Not your rest. Okay, and then funny story. So I was on a wait list for workout, and then I didn't get my but also it's gonna work out at six fifteen. Definitely oh, offer like Bible degrees. I major in communication and English. So, uh, I was so great. Yeah, I started out. I was like, oh, you know. I was going to be a pastor one day. I kind of decided, well. Wow. Uh, and there's not it's not like diversity. That is if you're signing up to go into vocational ministry. Um, Tom and Deborah Guthrie, they go to Mosaic. Oh, you're going to get in trouble. So <laughs> they, yeah, I don't know him, but like, I heard so much about this Kyle guy. I might have to meet him one day. Yeah, my parents both are really involved in Providence Academy. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those are high school students. And there for a while, the Providence, what are the high school students? Made mosaic. They're quasi triple. Oh, that was your time. What's the difference? More. I mean, am I lying? Absolutely. And now they all left and went to the shuttle. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sauce talk. Okay, now I'm like, we'll have like one shake. Oh, 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 hey, I trust his leadership. Shut up. Thank you. Lou, shut your mouth. Worst time. No, stop talking. Worst yeah, time. Yeah, I got to work at what? No, the Miracle Whip the Coast. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, oh, that's a good one. Exactly. Did you like having great hair? Did anyone want buffalo sauce? You know what? I was not there. I thought it was a little bit. I heard it. Grace oh, lettuce oh, bowl. Trying to get Rhett to give me a buffalo right now. A buffalo? Like a, a, a real oh, live buffalo. Everybody no. wants a buffalo. A dead buffalo. How was the rest of the In my office, I want a buffalo. Oh, no. So good, right? Oh, yeah, the... Uh, and the 
The coat the has the shoes. What's the it shoes called? Oh, it's a dermatologist. Oh. Taxidermy. Taxidermy. That is, yeah, that's in a room. So they, once your coat has this camp for these little kids, and they've got dead animals. What's up, Ezel? I know. I did that three the other day. He called me Kester, and then he's like, oh, Ezel. So you married into the heart? Yeah, a little bit. Go cats. That's right, wild cats. So is it your favorite movie? Um, not no, Over Hunt for the Wilderness, but it's pretty good. It's up there. Yeah, so it's it's so you need to watch this. Why did you watch the part right now? I'm just, you know, I want to... Yeah? Just a little, a little over. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he was on like seven dollars a You should have one of these in front of you with your name on it. That would help me um, know who you are. There's one marker. Fellowship's okay, really? having budget yeah. prices. We only have one bu one marker in the whole church. Hey, I feel like I was talking to someone else about it. I've been doing it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's let's uh, get going, and let's start with this, and it will help me to get to know you, and you to get to know each other better. So, so, wow. 
<laughs> yes, there's a camera in here. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You're, oh. Uh, Nick, oh, Nick's yeah. probably recording us. Don't say anything out of pocket. All right, so you, we'll go around, say our names, and you get to choose one of these three. And you've got to be brief. Give us an interesting fact about you. A hobby. We're not looking for a story about your hobby. Or um, your favorite movie. It's or or all of this. Pick one. Choose one. Choose one. And this this may spark a conversation in the future between you and I, or you and someone else, or give you a memory hook to remember someone. Oh, that's the Lord of the Rings guy, or um, that kind of thing. Um, so let's just go in order, and we'll start with Mrs. Ezel. Oh. Kennedy. Um, let's see. I could say my favorite movie. I always go back to Footloose, and I want to say the old one, but I think the new one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes me want to dance. Fellowship Fable mm -hmm. College. Oh, yes. All right. I'm not ready for this. Um, my name is Isaac. Good <laughs> 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 One more. Um, then. Favorite movie. That's a tough one. You can do You're boring and have no hobbies. Boom. That roasted. <laughs> Not interesting. Don't have any hobbies. Hmm. Um, I'll just go with the dark. Those are really good. Hmm. All right. Hmm. Hmm. I'm Matt. Hey, Matt. All right, good. And. Uh, interesting fact, I uh, square dance competitively for a year. Yeah, Shut up! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hold up. We are. We're going to bring it back. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was crunching my chip. <laughs> I heard competitively. Square dance. Square, dance. square dance, for reals. I thought you were going to say that you were a vegetarian up until a certain age. Everybody what? knows that one. <laughs> they know that one? Yeah. <laughs> I used to love watching your dad sneak chicken fingers behind your mom's back. <laughs> That's a he, he'd come to ball practice eating slims. I'd be like, I thought you were a vegetarian. He goes, don't tell. <laughs> Jack. My name is Jack, and I will say my interesting fact is that I can speak French fluently. What? Harley. Prove it. Prove it. Somebody asked me a question. Um, a movie. Small feet like a Rocky Balboa. Oh, own bar a la plage. What does that mean? Go to the beach. Let's go to the beach. Took a year French. So boot play. So boot play. I'm Isaiah. An interesting fact: uh, all my family lives in Kenya. Lives in where? In Kenya. I thought you were from Cersei. <laughs> where did I get that from? <laughs> no, I, I grew up in Cersei, but like everyone else besides my immediate nuclear family is in Kenya. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get mad at me. You're the one that's from Cersei. I know. I know. As a past, I thought I had moved on. When I came back from the U of A, I chose to tell no one of that. <laughs> you told me. And Jack, I, I should have stayed there. Where did you learn to speak French fluently? Because that's not academic learning. Well, yes, I went to a French immersion school uh, in Tulsa. It's a public school called Eisenhower in the age of five. So I just took it all the way. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Uh, my name is Cody. Yeah. Uh, I serve in the... Uh, Fable uh, suburb recovery landing uh, down there. Uh, and a, a hobby of mine is uh, I do flint napping, make my care and stuff. That's cool. Flint mapping. Flint napping. Napping. Oh, yeah. Every really you took a nap on flint. No, that's, 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 that's the process it's called. And where did you come from? 
Uh, born and raised Fayetteville. Okay. <laughs> Were you a part of Fellowship Fayetteville or a part of Celebrate Recovery? Uh, Fellowship Fayetteville. And I fell into Celebrate Recovery through, during college. So I've been in, in Celebrate Recovery since I'm on And were you are you new fellowship or old fellowship meaning has your family ever been to pleasant grove road or are y'all pure we we used to well pure we used to go pleasant grove road, road and then my family stopped going to church when i was in seventh grade so then when i was able to drive i started going to church on my own awesome good yeah, to have you alexis and my favorite movie is parent trap mm. by um, I was going to tie this in with an interesting fact. I think my fault is that I fall asleep during most, if not all, movies. So it's hard to get through them. Even like at the movie theater? Yes, always. That's wow. hilarious. And Foster, are you are you local or you, did you come here from somewhere else? Bentonville. You're a Bentonville Foster. Who are your parents? Um, Dean and Jerry. Okay. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm Keaton. I'm at, I'm from Texas. Um, Where from in Texas? East Texas, Tyler. Mm -hmm. There's a torch. <laughs> Sorry. There's a torchbearer center there called His Hill. You ever heard of it? Mm -mm. So we use Ravencrest and Timberline for camp. Mm -hmm. His Hill is the third. Torch Bear Center in the United States, oh, cool. but apparently not very big to the locals. It's not. <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> very unpopular locally. And what are you choosing, Keaton? Um, interesting fact: I got to go bungee jumping in South Africa. It's right. actually the world's largest bridge for Cape Cod. Was it wow. Cape Cod? Uh, no, I, I loved it. it was and I heard you say Keaton. Keaton. I say Keaton so that you hear the tin because usually everyone, if I say, hi, I'm Keaton, they go, Keith. So. <laughs> That's an interesting fact. And then I go, no, Keaton. And they're like, oh, Keaton. So I just decided I'm going to introduce you. Where'd Keaton. you go to college? Texas A&M. Woo. Oh, no, no, so loud. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go for it. Hi, I'm Elizabeth with an S. That'll come into the later. Got it. Mm -hmm. Alexis with an E. <laughs> Elizabeth with an S. Yeah. Um, not from here. Moved from Florida. I grew up in Kansas. Woo! Um, and then. It's not a movie, but it's my favorite series is Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen it way too many times. So, so I feel like I could be a doctor at this point. <laughs> a doctor who? <laughs> and how did you find us? Long story short, Scott Sanders knows Pope, and then Amy Lee Sanders, her brother works here. So. Got it. Yep. Scott Sanders. Got it. Um, I'm Carrie. I'm doing digital media, Fayetteville, digital resourcing, whatever you call it. Um, and my go to interesting fact is that I did ballet for 20 years of my life. Whoa. Okay. That's my go to. It works. 2019, whatever. And where are you from? I'm from Bentonville. Do you know the Fosters? Those ones <laughs> I know one of them. <laughs> Elizabeth with a Z. Yes, that's me. Um, I am Rogers Mill Elementary. Um, and from Kansas, but went to U of A. Um, interesting fact: I love SNL. Current SNL. Past SNL, the history of it. Love it. <laughs> so, you too? No. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you, my son got my daughter, so I'll tell you all, all about me. But three kids all came through fellowship. My daughter works at Frontier Cove, she's the girls' director. Um, middle son, Luke. Um, works as a businessman locally. And then there's Isaac, who's a senior in college. But Isaac gave Grace for her birthday a... Um, 
a date night with her boyfriend, but he presented it to her. What's the guy that he's like the New York tourist guy and he talks with his hands over his mouth? SNL. Oh, um, uh, it's Bill Hader, and it's the. Uh, What's that guy's name? It's like Stefan. 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 So Isaac Stephane. did a Stefan skit for Grace oh, that's for incredible. Frontier Cove is in Adair, and, and he's like, he did the whole thing, and it was we were on the floor, and I don't even know Stefan very well. But you would have loved it. You would have loved it. It was it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> Allie? Eilie. Eilie. Yes. It is an I. Yeah. Yes. Um, my favorite movie is Over the Titans. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from Michigan. How'd you find us? Uh, the internet. The webs? Yes. So you just type, what did you Google search? <laughs> um, there's probably something like residency programs, big churches, something. Yeah. 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 Best church ever. (laughs) How to disappoint my parents after graduating. (laughs) Too soon. My daughter did the residency. I tried to talk her out of it. She said, Dad, didn't you invent this? I was like, yes. She goes, didn't you invent it with no pay? I was like, yep. She's, I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> I'm Jane Ellen. I'm doing the landing CR residency in Rogers. Mm-hmm. And a hobby, so I graduated Decem- in December of last year, and I worked at a flower shop for a semester, and I work at a flower shop in Fayetteville now. So flowery things and mm. events and stuff mm. like that is fun. Fun. Yeah. Mm. That is an interesting fact and a hobby. Adri? It's really close. It's Audrey. But there's no R. Or did you just misspell There is an R. <laughs> you misspelled it's your a, name. No, oh. it's A-D-R-I. That's just how I write it. Okay. But my name is Audriana. Fully. Audriana. 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 So Audrey. Not Audrey. Audrey, like with a U. No. That, it's because my family's Hispanic, so Adriana is like Adri. So you wouldn't Got say it. Adri in, in that. But... It happens. Do you speak Spanish? There is like, you should pick my game for the explanation of my name. Never mind. No, that's me. Do you speak? Uh, oh, I'm the best. Yes, that was right. Right. There was right. Do you speak Spanish? Yes. Like, yeah, I don't do that. Great. Um, I am working with Mosaic students for the rest of the team. And um, one of my hobbies is playing racquetball. I love racquetball. Good. Good. Well, I'm Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and this is about you for Brandy. And I have been here for 27 years on staff, um, 29 years going to fellowship. So when I was 19, I was living in a fraternity house on Stadium Drive, very far from God, not interested in God, but also very unhappy as a person. And so I was your typical um, Southern college Greek brat and and um, had some substance abuse issues, um, moral issues. And <clears throat> it was the second week of my junior year. And so I'd gotten back from the summer and decided it was time to go around that cycle again. So first football game of the year, if you've been around U of A, you kind of know what that's like. So it starts about Wednesday night and goes all the way through Sunday. So I woke up on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, um, very hungover, dehydrated. And I remember just sitting there, my roommate never made it back in. So I was there alone. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't like this. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember thinking, I almost died last night because that's not atypical for some of this risky behaviors we were doing. And then I thought, 
if I were to have died, I don't know if any of the guys in this house would have even come to my funeral. I don't think we care about each other. We're using one another. Um, and literally, a guy knocks on the door, which in our fraternity house, nobody ever knocked. You just kind of entered. So I thought that was odd. And when I opened it, it was a guy who had gone to Kaleo. His name was Steve. He's actually a pastor at Central Methodist in Fayetteville. His name's Steve Pulliam. And he had a Bible in his hands. And he said, hey, you're probably not interested, but we're going to start a Bible study downstairs in the formal room tonight if you want to come. And I heard the voice of God in my head say, there's a guy that cares about you. So I looked at him and said, I wouldn't wait on me and shut the door in his face. And then I had this debate for about two or three hours on whether I would go to this Bible study. Now, in the meantime, for over two years, my brother had gone to Washita Baptist University to play football. He was very much like me. I, like him, a partier. He ended up at this Baptist school living wrong, and he met a girl who started taking him to church, and he became a Christian down there. And he had been writing me these letters, and he bought me a Bible. And so I had this kind of evangelistic stream of consciousness going with him and another friend. Both of them were kind of talking to me about the Lord. What I found out later is a bunch of people were praying for me. People from my hometown, my my now wife, um, and a whole bunch of people on campus. If you've been in campus ministry and y'all have a prayer list for like the really lost people, I was at the top of that list. So I decided to go to the Bible study. I was so nervous to go that they might call on me to open to a book of the Bible and find a verse, and I'd never really opened the Bible, that I took the Bible out of the box, like literally unwrapped it out of the plastic, tore the table of contents out, and stuck it in the very back for easy reference so I wouldn't look stupid. Went to the Bible study, didn't understand a word they said. I don't remember what we were studying. I just remember it sounded like a jumbled mess of words. So I went back the next week, more jumbled mess of words. And I called my big brother and I said, hey, I've been going to Bible study. And he goes, that's really good, but Bible study is not going to get you into heaven. And man, you need to stop drinking. And so he kind of challenged me not just to have some religious attendance, but to do something about it. So I went to the Bible study third week and some of it made sense. We were talking about sin. We were talking about heaven. And I, I stayed after and grabbed a guy and I said, hey, this is all well and good. This Ephesus or whatever y'all are talking about. But how do I not go to hell? And his face lit up and he shared the gospel with me and gave me Romans 10, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. So I went up to my room and, and prayed to receive Christ and had a dramatic, radical conversion in my fraternity house. And um, the Bible study was a part of student mobilization. I know that Kennedy's been a part of that. Anybody else familiar? Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, they were there to walk me along in the faith. And then I went to Kaleo um, at the end of my junior year, came back to my fraternity house thinking, man, I wonder if there's some guys like me who would like to come to know the Lord. And we had a group of about eight guys my junior year. All of them moved out, and I was there by myself. So I decided, oh, I'm going to lead a Bible study. It was the worst Bible study in the history of mankind. <laughs> We had a couple of kids from Little Rock Catholic that ate my lunch. They had read more Bible than I had ever read and taken religious classes and stuff. Um, and so that began my journey in ministry. The second week after I became a Christian, a friend of mine said, hey, I want to take you to a church, but it's all the way up in Lowell. We actually were in Lowell at one point. We annexed into Rogers so we could get water. <laughs> we were on... We were on um, septic tanks and rural utilities for many years. They brought me here. And this was the only place as a new believer that I ever felt comfortable. Even when I would go to the Stumo meetings or the Stumo Bible studies, I went to another church to visit one Sunday morning. I just never felt comfortable. And when I walked in the doors of fellowship, I was home day one and just loved it here. 
And so I've never left. I came here for two years as a new believer. Um, my wife and I got engaged and became married, and, and we um, ran out of the runway of college ministry, meaning we aged out. So um, all of our friends either got jobs or moved away, kind of like the phase of life you're in right now. And then it would be odd to go and lead the Bible study in my fraternity house anymore. So we didn't know what to do. So I literally just called the front desk of the church and said, my name's Sam. I've been going here for two years. Nobody knows me. I don't know any of you, but me and my fiance would like to volunteer to help do something. And they said, okay, and sent me to the student ministry department. Student ministry guy took me out for pizza, asked me to volunteer in the student ministry, and Amy and I started volunteering here. And the student ministry was a little bit unhealthy, would be a, a nice way to say it. Um, our student ministry at that point was mimicking a ministry called Young Life. Is anybody familiar with Young Life? Great ministry, great heart, but not for church kids at all. So their, their idea is to dumb down Christianity and hype up fun and acceptance. Um, and so some Young Life chapters have a place where the kids can smoke or um, lots of laid back rules. And that wasn't working for fellowship families who wanted their kids discipled. So that youth minister transitioned to another role at the church. They gathered the volunteers together and said, who will help us until we hire a new youth pastor? And Amy and I raised our hands along with two other people. The rest of them left. And so they never hired anybody, and I'm still here. <laughs> That's the short end of it. Amy and I volunteered for a while, and then Robert and Kennedy's grandfather, Gary, took us out to lunch one day and said, hey, I was a stockbroker right out of college, by the way. They said, have you ever thought about ministry? And I said, man, I really have. I just... I haven't had an opportunity. Stumo's not my cup of tea. They've wanted me to come on. And, um, I don't know. And they said, well, what do you think about coming on with us and helping us get through? You could be our interim youth pastor. So Amy and I prayed about it and took a four-month commitment. That was our commitment from fellowship. And then um, about two months into it, uh, they came back to us and said, hey, we think you're our guy. We're going to stop interviewing why don't you and Amy stay? And we hired um, the two other volunteers, Derek Horn, who's still with us, and this guy named Murray Williams, who's crazy. You'll catch him at JJ's Thursday nights sometimes. <laughs> He's, he was our worship guy. He's still doing music out there. Um, and we did student ministry for 12 years here at Fellowship and basically built FSM, as you know, FSM and Mosaic Student Ministry today. Then I did family ministry at Fellowship for five years, which meant birth to graduation plus singles. And then I've been the congregational leader of Fellowship Rogers um, for whatever's left, 12 plus 5 minus 27. And so that's my role now. So we have four congregational leaders. Me here, Mark Schatzman has Bentonville, Clark Nolan has Fayetteville, Rodney Holmstrom has CR, um, and then we will have a fifth congregational leader when Mosaic replaces um, Newman. And so that's what I do. Who's on my Rogers team? Wait. Raise your hand if you're on the Rogers team. Rogers in general? No, Rogers. Uh, Rogers congregation. So are you, are you CR? CR yeah. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. <laughs> but I meant more formally just the Rogers Sunday morning. So we've got, we've got four residents. Is that right? All right. All right. <clears throat> I love you all, but I'm responsible for them. Uh -huh. So, Hey, uh, <laughs> any questions about my story? Do y'all want me to pick one of these? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have shot someone with a handgun. That's my interesting fact. And I won't explain it. I'm just going to let it dangle there. And let you think about it. Yeah. I always drop that one at like an icebreaker. Yeah. Um, and I have some legal trouble in Canada. Brandon. Also Brandon. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, what's your uh, interesting fact? Oh, did we, we just look like Skippy? Is that why y'all did that? You know why I did that? 
Because we 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 because we talked and I got all yeah, your stuff. Sure, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> who wants to keep skipping Brandon and let's just do that to him? Yeah. And who wants to hear from Brandon? So we got four skips. Yeah, skips fine. Let's go. No, go ahead, Brandon. Good, because I didn't finish my lunch. Uh, my name is Brandon Guthrie. Um, and did anyone do hobby? Did anyone? I did. You did hobby? Okay, well, I'm going to do hobby. Ballet. Well. Okay, okay, yeah, So, yeah. hobby flowers? Most people did interesting factor movies. So, I'm going to do hobby. Um, I collect DVDs and Blu-rays. I have about 340. So, that's my... Where? You almost that by fits my parents' house. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money, man. The top room is dedicated to your movies. The the top of my uh, closet at this place has a couple of my best movies, and then the rest of them are my parents. Is there like a certain genre or is it just favorites or anything? How do you organize them? Uh, alphabetical. Objectively, which is the best one? Do you mean as far as like what my favorite movie is or like what's the best collector's item? Objectively. Like as a collector's item? What? No, 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 no. Yes. What is the best movie? Uh, Alright. So my best collector's item is a trilogy called The Human Condition, and it sells for roughly a hundred fifty dollars. Dang. Uh, each movie's like three hours long. Oh, wait, hold on. I was like, wait, hold on. There was another lunch. Yeah, that's the wrong. Thank you for coming. Take home to the village. We're going to bring them to the Oh, yeah, we'll take them. All right, does anybody want another lunch? Let's go to the sanctum. Elizabeth, no, I'm going to. Brandon, um. Same goal as is there a aftermarket increase in value on DVDs? No. And oh, so this is just <laughs> you, your hobby is to engage in obsolete media forms. Sure, yeah. Have you watched all of them? Oh heck no, I've watched it. <laughs> Wait, yeah. So you just buy them? Well, I go to Walmart about, in those big bins and dig through them. I've got about a hundred I haven't seen. Ever. Are you going to? Well, of course, yeah. I didn't buy them for nothing. That is an interesting fact. All right, and he had a hobby. He makes arrowheads out of flint by napping. All right, so um, what we want to uh, oh, I want to I want to talk about the resins. <clears throat> so, fellowship had had we've we've been engaging student leaders since Brian Pope, <clears throat> who's our global outreach pastor, was our middle school pastor in nineteen probably ninety nine. In 1999, Finley Robinson was our first ever student leader. And so one of the unique things about our church is that we have over 220 high school and junior high students serving in children's ministry or other roles. And as I interact with churches around the country, a lot of them will kind of ask, hey, what's the secret sauce or what are y'all doing well or what's going on there? And, And, you know, back in the early 90s, we might could say, hey, we're actually, we don't have hymnals. I remember we used to kind of brag on that. We were, we were the first church in North Arkansas to not have hymnals and to not have pews and to use a projector and to not lead with a pipe organ or a piano. We were. And, and, and we were the first church to take off the ties. And in fact, I came to my interview with Robert and Gary. By the way, I have to do this now because last two years ago, the residents asked who Robert was. So it was a transitional time. Robert Cup is our founder. Um, still around. You'll see him around. He'll probably end up interacting with you guys. Gary Harrell was his second hire. So Robert, Mickey, and Gary are kind of like the trinity of <laughs> fellowship. There are there are Washington, Jefferson, whoever the third guy is in U.S. history. Franklin? I don't know. Madison? Um, it's kind of like our Obi-Wan, our Yoda, and our 
Anakin. 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 I'm going with Anakin. No. Yeah. No. No. This is a traitor in fellowship. That's not good. Uh, that's not good. That's not he false. came back around. At the end of Return of the Jedi, he was standing over there in, in pre-Darth Vader form. That's true. So, I remember in my interview, Gary actually threatened to cut my tie off. Because I wore a tie to the interview, because that's what you did in 1994. You dressed up for interviews, which I'm sure none of you even considered when you were interviewing for the residency. Um, and so, those are no longer distinctives. Every church does all of those things now. There are still some distinctives. I've yet to find another church that mobilizes high school and junior high students to do missions on spring break and to serve continually in the ministry. And um, it's very unique. In fact, we have a larger number of students serving in our ministry than most churches have in their student ministry. So just think about those numbers. 220 would be a very large youth group. And uh, we have that many serving. So it's just really unique and cool. Well, what happened is you get the Kennedy Kessners, Ezels of the world who grew up in that model, go to college, become a cell leader, and their development track, the Matthew Siders, their, their development track is going, and then what do we do with them now? And at the same time, Fellowship used to office in all of the houses that are now the village. Those were our offices before this building was built. When this building was built, we had all these houses, and we thought, what are we going to do? Well, Roberts had this great idea. We'll make it our missionary housing but we had extra ones. We didn't have that many missionaries. What are we going to do with these? So we came up with the idea. What if we got college graduates? We didn't have a lot of success with college students because their schedules and driving from U of A to do ministry with us just didn't always work out very well. So college graduates who were interested in ministry but weren't ready for seminary, um, didn't know if ministry was their thing, maybe wanted to do a gap year and serve the Lord. So that's how the residency was birthed with, I think we had a first class with six residents. <clears throat> and here's the goal. Here would be my goals for you. I want you to leave in May tired. So I hope we wear you out and I hope we abuse you. <laughs> like if we told you to work 30, I hope we work you 35 a week. And here's why. I want you to taste what it's like so that you'll know if you're called to vocational ministry. So I want you to have your heart broken this year by a student or somebody critiquing you or whatever. And I want you to experience the thrill of leading someone to the Lord or helping disciple someone and to experience the greatest moments and the hardest moments so that you're equipped to know what you want to do with the rest of your life. So my daughter did the residency and then she was offered a job in the Springdale Public Schools by four different principals. They were all calling her. We want Grace Hannon. We want Grace Hannon. And so she decided to go raise support and work for New Life Ranch. Why? Because of the residency. She got in here and tasted what ministry was like, and she's hooked. And the same principal just called her two weeks ago, and she told him, no, again, I don't want to teach right now. I want to do ministry. And so, and then there may be some of you who say, you know what? I've tasted ministry in a healthy place, and it's not for me. I want to be a teacher or I want, we've had some go to med school, law school, grad school. Um, I want to go into missions. Um, and I'm glad I did this because it taught me that maybe church ministry is not for me. Um, and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a great year for you. I hope this year you find out some things you're good at. So um, I know Jack's about to teach in what, three weeks? Three weeks. You ever done a sermon before? No, I haven't. All right. So, so you're going to find out that, that you like this. Maybe you have a little aptitude for it, or maybe it would be a struggle for you. Um, Ken Kennedy's grandfather was one of my mentors, and uh, Gary has a profound hatred for public speaking, and he was a preacher. He took speech by correspondence at U of A. So that means he wrote his speeches in. He never gave them. Yet he had to get on a platform in front of thousands of people and preach. And he was a wreck for two weeks. Every time he did it, 
for the whole time I knew him. And since he's retired, he's never returned to the pulpit. We've offered him many dates, and he just smiles real big and says, no, thank you. <laughs> so you're about to find out, Jack, what you're made of, um, and that's a good thing. Some of you are going to find out you have a, a knack for counseling and, um, or evangelism, or you're really administrative. I've heard some of the meetings that, that Matthew and the, the FSM team are having even now about fall events, and, and you'll just figure all of that out. And so we're here to help you discover stuff about you, and then we need the help. We have thousands of people here. We could hire unlimited staff and never meet the needs, and so this is a way for us to scratch your back while you scratch our back. So we're leveraging this free housing to leverage a need in your life, and then hopefully it'll be a break-even year for you. But we're not going to put a bunch of money in your pocket, but hopefully we'll keep you fed, keep you insured. Um, you won't go into debt, and you can work your job and buy your lattes and um, <laughs> all of that. And then at the end of it, I will say this. You're marketable. People start calling us and asking about our residents. Do you have a resident? We have this position. Like I already know of positions that are coming up at New Life Ranch. Grace told me about yesterday. So if you're interested in Christian camping, I get my application into the ranch. At the end of the summer, they're going to have some turnover um, with some staff. And so um, we have other churches hire our residents. Sometimes fellowship has a position open um, and we hire our residents. <clears throat> and so, so I hope it's a great year for you. I would say this, our staff's attitude towards you is that you're not the pledges. You're not our um, interns. You're our fellow staff. You're not under us. You're alongside of us. And you're going to realize that really quickly. People are going to want to know your names, and it, I'll tell you, it's very odd. There's not many businesses out there or corporations or churches or ministries that will treat you like we're going to treat you. And I want you to know our doors are open to you. So if you ever want to talk theology, ministry, life, wisdom, then my door's open. Let's go get a chicken biscuit and we'll sit down and talk. And I would actually challenge you that don't waste that opportunity to have access to Mickey Rapier or Clark Nolan, or um, Christy Morris, or Amy Anderson's like one of the most fabulous human beings you will ever meet in your whole life. I'm like the, her biggest fan. And don't waste the opportunity you have to glean from us some of the things we've learned. And so as guys like me roll into class, <clears throat> you're going to find a connection like, I like the soup that guy's that guy's cooking, um, then that means you need to follow up with me, or maybe Nick Rowland is is your jam. You need to follow up with Nick, and um, you'll get lots of time with Matt and Carrie um, because that's what they do. Um, but pursue the rest of us as well. If you get any time with Robert, take it. Um, we, in Robert, we have a seminary level. I would even say that a director of a Bible department at a seminary sitting in-house. He's better than any seminary prof I ever have, and I went all the way through DTS. I didn't tell you all that. Did my first degree at DTS, did my second degree at Gordon-Conwell, up just outside of Boston to get my doctorate. So I have a doctorate in preaching. So one of my expertise things I bring to the table is training people how to preach. And so if that's an interest of yours, then I can help you with that. Jack. What's Robert's name? Robert. Robert Cup. And he lives on the back side of the village. So the red brick house is Robert's. And the story on that is that Robert bought all of the land east of the annex. So all of that swatch of land that we own um, and moved from Bentonville to live in that house so that fellowship could own that property and, and put the village in. And then he's going to live there till he dies. And then the property will revert back to us. And so that's why y'all can't use the gate. That's the only thing he's ever asked is I just don't want people driving in front of my house all day. So, so Robert's out there. He's usually right above this room in the library study. That's what he does for retirement. It's a blast. Studies. Yeah, I, studies. I, I, I walked up there. And saw the Bible. Yeah, nuts. <laughs> studies, books, the Bible. He just loved, that's Robert's hobby of studying theology and all that. So, 
You saw him up there? Yeah, I, I walked up there and I walked in and it was like, whoa. And he's just like, yeah, just, just go through whatever you want. I'm like, what? <laughs> Blew my mind. Now, does anybody need help finding a job? Does everybody have a job yet? Like, not at Fellowship, your other job. Um, you don't have one? Um, I saw a sign at Arvest Bank that said they're paying three or five, I can't remember, three or five hundred dollar signing bonuses to be tellers. Also, Burger King has that signing bonus. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. McDonald's used to have it, they don't have it anymore. Yeah. So, but, um, shoot, shoot me an email that says some of the things that would be something you think was fun to do as your side gig, and, and we'll look around for you. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? Questions on the residency or me before we hop into our topic? <coughs> Or any questions about anything at fellowship that aren't to do with philosophy of ministry or that kind of thing? <laughs> Stuff you can't figure out around here. What is um, your least favorite thing about fellowship? Something that you want to see change? <sighs> That's a great. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume you mean internally. Yeah. Yeah. Because my I mean. my thing I want to change right now is is. Uh, more to do with the people than the staff or the culture. I just think this has been a hard year and the the graciousness of people's interactions has a new low watermark because of the political conversation revolving around the election, racism, and COVID. And people just think it's okay to be rude and mean right now. And I would love for that to stop. And I think the body of Christ has taken a black eye from the people of Christ this year. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for our people to be more mature. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So that's what I would change in them. It's much easier to point out something to change in them than in us. I'm still thinking for us. Isaiah? <laughs> You changed your sign. Uh, what, what's your take on bucket hats? Bucket hats? <laughs> um, I do have two. Uh, I'm a fisherman, so I do wear a cowboy hat sometimes, but I do have a couple of bucket hats. Yeah. It's better than sunscreen is what I would say. Okay. But I do think it's a dad move. <laughs> Are you a bucket hat guy? Yeah. <laughs> it's a loaded question, essentially. Is it an inside joke? Yeah, a, a little bit. Okay. But you're, the, you're the progenitor of the inside joke, actually. Can you have a definition of that word? Yeah, progenitor is like, he's like the... Yeah, I guess. I started the joke about bucket hats? Yeah. You, you, you commented once about it, about me wearing a bucket hat. It was class. <laughs> I did. <laughs> then don't do it, man. I don't wear a bucket hat. So I was conned then, too. Yeah. I wear them for sun protection when I fish, but I wouldn't recommend it as like a fashion statement. <laughs> it is coming back in fashion. Is it? Well, here's I also would say this. I am not the fashion trend setter. Is that fair? That's fair. Like, I'm not even, like, up to date on dad styles. So, and if I do have anything that's in style, it's because somebody got it for one of my sons and it didn't fit them. I got these from Luke because he didn't like them. Yeah. All right. Brandon, I'm still thinking. Yes. So this is on my mind because we were just talking about it over there yesterday. Uh, without beginning too long of a conversation, just quick thoughts. What are your views on free will and or predestination? Oh. <laughs> yes. I'll save that one. I'll save that one because of uh, the, Q we'll do a Q and A at the end, but, okay. or do y'all want me to just knock that out real quick? Well, we should bring our whole class over and then have them. The Antioch? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a great illustration to answer the question. Yes, sir. Did God choose you or did you choose him? He chose me. God chose me. Yeah. Chose me. I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is there's some sort of intersection. Okay. There will be nobody in heaven who didn't choose to be there. Mm -hmm. sure. Like nobody's going to be in heaven going, what? 
in the world. <laughs> I do not want to be here. <laughs> because Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. So there's got to be on the scale of on the scale <laughs> of providence and responsibility. Mm -hmm. These intersect somewhere. They are not like this. Yes, sir. And then there will be nobody in heaven that God didn't choose to be there. He's not going to be coming through. He's going to go, Isaiah? <laughs> in a bucket hat? <laughs> I thought that was you. Um, well, you can't see my eyes. I know. Really <laughs> uh, so... So Robert, Robert has this illustration. He says, over the gates of heaven is an arch. And it's not his illustration. I think it's like Martin Luther or Spurgeon or something. And it says, on the front of the arch, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. So it's, it's an invitation to all from Jesus. And on the back of the arch, it says, chosen before the beginning of the world. And so if you want to play those two concepts against each other, you are not going to build the body of Christ. That's what I do know. Yes, sir. And especially the angry, arrogant Calvinist. Um, they're usually the ones that pose the question, and they usually don't build the body of Christ. They are just there to destroy. Mm -hmm. And so, so I've never found the question to be beneficial if you don't give room mm -hmm. for some level of choice and some level of providence. So I always use those two illustrations or I guess it's three mm -hmm. did God choose you or did you choose him there will be nobody in heaven who didn't choose to be there or that God didn't choose to be there and then the archway and that's how I do it I'm a Calvinist mm -hmm. I'm a horrible one um, <laughs> like like I don't know if I'm I don't think I'm tulip and I don't have the bracelet I don't have the bracelet and I don't go to the conference but if I look at my story and I'm glad I've already shared it with you. I envision Jesus walking up the hill on Stadium Drive because my fraternity house was in between Lambda Chi and Fidel. It's a parking lot now. Um, but I, I envision him walking up the stairs saying, that's enough. That's enough. You're coming with me. And I'm all he chose me. He flicked the light switch and regenerated my heart. There's no way I would have been conscious of my sin without the Holy Spirit convicting me. Now, other people, I may see more human responsibility in them, um, but for me, I lean towards God. Is that good? Yes, sir. What would I change about fellowship? No, I came up with a really simple one. I would get Bentonville a road all the way out past Tiger Boulevard from McCollum to the next road down because I think it's going to be a nightmare when we open up there. Really? Three churches, one road. Three churches, one road. Anybody been to Fellowship Fayetteville? It's an, it was a nightmare before we got the out road to yeah. Dean Solomon. And Bentonville's going to be bigger. So that's one thing I would change. Is that a cop out? It's pretty easy. All right. So what I want to do today is I want to just to get to know you guys and have you be um, have some fun with each other and with me. But I want us to. So from what I understand, um, Shotsman came and, and talked to you about mission vision. Yes. So who can quote our, our mission statement? We exist to produce and release what? Spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders. And then it gets a little complicated. Who? Know and express the authentic Christ. Christ. To Northwest Arkansas and the world. So Mark handled that. And then Michael came and talked to you about community last week. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to download our membership session that I do. We, our class is called Discover. And what this session is designed to do is it's like if you were buying a car and you like the outside of the car and you like the inside of the car, but you said, hey, what makes it go? Can I look under the hood? And you, you would want to discover, first of all, is this a electric? Is it a hybrid? Is it a, a fossil fuel? And then is it gas or diesel? Then you would want to know, is this a four-cylinder, a six-cylinder, an eight-cylinder? Does it have turbo? All that kind of stuff. And so what's under the hood at Fellowship is called our philosophy of ministry. 
And so in thinking about things that are concrete and abstract, these things are going to be more abstract, but they inform the concrete. So Michael talked to you about celebration cell. These things inform that. Does that make sense? Because of these things, we are celebration cell. So these in a hierarchical order are above strategy. Philosophy should drive strategy. And so you have a philosophy about your life. You have a philosophy about the way you date, or you have a philosophy about the way you spend your money, and it informs your decisions. So these are these big picture things. Um, first thing is just to understand fellowship. Understand these three metaphors. I'll fly through these. First thing we are is a greenhouse. Fellowship is a place to come and heal and grow. And so whether you need healing like at CR, or whether you just need to hide in the back for a while and see if you can trust the church again, or whether you need a place to come and cry and sing or pray or whatever, we're, we're a greenhouse. And in, in a greenhouse, things heal and grow. Secondly, uh, or so the last thing is we're a launching pad. So right there in our mission statement, we're here to release spiritual leaders. So it is our hope that someone who comes here grows to the um, level that they're actually sent from here. Sometimes that's sent within here. Sometimes it's sent around here. And sometimes it's sent far away from here. So whether it's local or global, sent. And you are right now in the launching pad. That This is what we're doing with you. Therefore, we need a training center. So you guys are a part of the training center we are releasing you to go do Mosaic Student Ministry, go do Children's Ministry, go do College Ministry, go do CR Ministry. Um, Isaiah, I'm assuming you're a worship intern mm -hmm. for someone. Um, and so uh, we are we are trying to accomplish all three things in your life, but this is who we are as a church, is that we are not just a place to have services. We have an agenda, is we want to see you grow in your faith. We want to see you trained in your faith, and then we want to release you. And we don't have to keep you. And that's unique. I met with the new director for Downline Ministries yesterday. So if, if any of you are familiar with Downline, think Memphis, Ken and Vaughn, Soup Campbell. Um, they have a one-year thing just like this. For adults mainly, they don't deal with college students very much. They're launching in the fall of 22. He came and met. And I sat across from lunch with David yesterday, and I said, hey, I would love it if you would take five of my best leaders from Springdale. They actually became your five best leaders. He's like, what? And I was like, because we'll fill those five spots, and you need five good leaders, and we need you. Because there are going to be people who don't get discipled at fellowship, but will get discipled at downline, and we want you here. He's not going to hear that from very many churches. We have the word release in our mission statement. And so that means holding everybody with an open hand and, being, and saying God's will be done. So three metaphors, pretty simple stuff. What I want to give you today are four principles. Uh, we'll spend... The majority of our time on the first two, we'll fly through the last two. So if you're one of those timekeepers, don't get discouraged that I'm going to keep you long. Fellowship, this is the first one. Fellowship strongly believes in the priesthood of every believer. So in church culture, most churches have a separation between the clergy or the pastoral team, and the laity, or the congregants. That separation is by duty. That separation sometimes is by the way they dress, sometimes by their title. So in most churches, you would not call me Sam. Um, I would have you call me Dr. Hannon. I went to school for a long time to earn that. Or I would have you call me Reverend Hannon or Brother Hannon or Pastor Hannon, and even in that thing, separation. There are those who are called to ministry, and there are those who come to sit under the ministry. Sometimes the, the guy has his, or lady, has their own parking spot, or they're the only ones that wear the name badge, or that kind of thing. Fellowship believes that all believers are called to ministry, but is that biblical? 
Well, there's actually some great theology behind the priesthood of every believer. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 is not a verse just for pastors. It says, we are therefore Christ's what? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So I'm not the only one who evangelizes. I'm not the only one who disciples. I'm not the only one who offers counsel or wisdom or care. All of us do it. Fellowship believes in every member ministry. We don't have the pastoral staff and then the parking crew, the coffee crew, the greeters. Does that make sense? Um, down here, this is a key passage and has been for us since our founding. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And I believe verse 12 applies to the last phrase. Verse 12 is expounding on pastors and teachers. What do pastors and teachers do? Prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So in our philosophy of ministry, we do not believe that the pastors are called to do the work of the ministry. We'll do it. We're player coaches. We are actually called to recruit other people to train and equip them and to release them to do the work of the ministry. Does that make sense? Um, most churches look like this. So the weight of the ministry is on the clergy, the pastor, the priest. Well, how does a church grow in influence or reach? Well, you get a pastor who has a high capacity. So you get a really talented, gifted um, energetic guy or lady, then they can grow this big ministry. What we want to do is we're flipping it upside down. And we don't build the ministry on the pastor or the staff team. We actually build it on our group of volunteers that we call spiritual leaders. That could be a 13-year-old serving with a kindergartner. It could be a 48-year-old leading a community group. It could be a 30-year-old mom lead, leading a mom's prayer group. It could be a 25-year-old drummer in the worship band. And what we do as a staff is we are here to equip, to empower, to cheerlead, to troubleshoot, to resource our spiritual leaders. So how do we grow our influence and our reach? Well, we produce and release spiritual leaders. Do y'all see it? The more spiritual leaders we have, the bigger fellowship has influence and reach. Does that make sense? It's an upside down model. And by the way, very unique to fellowship. Um, there are churches, all churches have volunteers. Not all churches have spiritual leaders. Some churches have spiritual leaders, but very few churches have pastoral types who aren't in the pulpit. And we will take you as a volunteer as far as you want to go. So we have guys and ladies that, that work for Walmart and Tyson, but you wouldn't be able to distinguish them from one of our staff people in what they do, whether that's preaching or doing funerals or weddings or counseling or that kind of thing um, from the paid professionals. Does that make sense? Is this... In the Bible? Well, yeah, Exodus chapter 18. I'll summarize this because it's a, kind of a long passage. But so, so Exodus 18, here's where we're at. Uh, out of Egypt, so that's Exodus 15, but in the desert and not in the promised land. So you got Moses leading a couple million people. And it says, the next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Which model is Moses on? On the triangles. Everything's coming down to him. So think about the problems you might have with two million people in the desert. Not enough water, not enough food. His goat kicked my goat. Um, our wives are fighting. His goat ran through our tent. He owes me uh, an animal skin to patch it. And they're all lined up. And only Moses is there. And um, they're standing around. There's some uh, supply chain issues. Moses answered his father-in-law, Why do I sit around? Because the people come to me 
to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Look what Moses' father-in-law said. What you're doing is what? This is not a good model. The upside down triangle where everything flows through one person or just a few people, this is not a good model. And he says, let me, let me, let me uh, tell you what's going to happen. You and these people are going to only wear yourselves out. So it's not good for Moses and it's not good for the Israelites. Turnover rate in ministry is huge. In fact, I've heard that right now there's a trend of lots of pastors calling it in because this last year has been so hard. People have been so harsh, so critical. Why are we wearing masks? Why aren't we wearing masks? Did you tell us to get vaccinated? We don't believe in the vaccine. Why didn't you tell us to get vaccinated? Um, You're talking too much about race. Why are you talking about race enough? You didn't support my candidate. Why did you support that candidate? Blah, blah, blah. And everybody heard a lot of pastors just quitting. In this scenario, Moses, man, the stress of handling all of these problems is going to wear you out. But also the people won't be satisfied. Listen to me and I'll give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Hey, Moses, you're right about one thing. It's on you. You are responsible for these people in the desert. Verse 20, but here's my advice. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the the duties they're to perform. Tell them what you expect of them, but select capable people, men who fear God, trustworthy people who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials. Listen to these numbers, over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but then bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide for themselves. Moses, raise up spiritual leaders. There'll be some spiritual leaders who are mature enough and have the capacity to handle thousands. And maybe that comes by having a (coughs) hundred leaders of 10. And there'll be people that are um, capable of handling 50. And then there's people that are capable of handling 10. And then if something comes up through one of those groups of 10 or one of those clusters of 50 or even one of those large groups of 1,000 and they just can't figure it out, that's what you are for, Moses. So you equip them, you release them, you trust them, but you're available to them. Does that make sense? This is our philosophy of ministry. Do y'all see it? Exodus 18 is like, one of our favorite passages. And Moses is commanded by Jethro to create more priests to get out there. So, so at fellowship, how many of you are small group leaders right now? Anybody? Anybody? So, so you get a person in your group, whether it's a peer or a student, and they come to you and say, I'm just struggling finding the words to pray. How many of you think you can handle that? Listen to them. I'm so sorry. Here's been my experience. Could we pray together? That kind of thing. Um, Somebody in your group comes to you and says, hey, I I have two job offers. One of them requires me to move. The other one's here. This one's more money. This one's less money. I probably prefer to do this, but I need the money there. I don't know what to do. What's God's will? How many of you think you can have a coffee and just kind of kick that around? All right. One of your people comes to you and says, my dad is abusing my little sister. How many of you feel equipped to handle that? That's what I'm here for. I handle that all the time, stuff like that. Abuse cases, divorce cases, substance abuse, all of that. I've been here 27 years. I don't know if I'll be surprised again. I hope not. But I've just been around the block. I've seen it all, everything. So you're going to come to me and I'm in my class on that in July. Uh, we have moral obligations. We have spiritual, you know, and I'll, I'll help you through it. I'll help you through it. Or your team leader will or your congregational leader will. Um, and so that's this model here. Priesthood of the believer doesn't mean we say, hey, nobody's in charge. Everybody's in charge. Everybody grab a Bible and go form your own little church. We'll call it all fellowship. Teach whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Tell people everything's okay. There's no sin. There's no standards. No. 
It's just releasing things on a level that's appropriate for the spiritual maturity of that person to get the whole of uh, the ministry done. Here's the results. That will make your load lighter, Moses, because they'll share it with you. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are what? Few. Moses, you need more laborers. You need more workers. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain. So if Moses, you're going to be healthier. By the way, fellowship has a pretty low turnover rate. We have guys and ladies that have been here, lots of them that have been here 20, um, 25 years. That blows up the expectations of just ministry tenure but definitely blows up the standards of church life in the South for pastors at the same church. Usually you churn and burn the pastors every five to 10 years and get a new one and churn and burn that one. People come to church and then they go and have their pastor for lunch and critique him and turn on him and and run him off. Um, And then the people will go home satisfied. That, that, the student ministry model of us doing small groups with leaders that are college age or young adult in homes, the students like that. Their names are known by the leaders as opposed to just being one face in 500 while we give away an Xbox every Wednesday night, which is a youth ministry model that's out there. Let's gather hundreds of kids, turn on the Hayes machine, play a couple of rock songs, have a game, preach the gospel. None of the kids' names are known. But we did have some raise their hands at the end of the service and said they received Christ. That's a win. It's not a win. We want to know our kids' names. We want to engage them and know what's going on. And that takes a lot of manpower. So, all right. So let's critique this one. Can anybody think of some dangers or some pros, or do you have any questions about priesthood of the believer? Jack. If you are releasing and releasing and releasing without properly equipping people, you're releasing people that are either untrained, or unready, or are going to, you know, probably spread a non-mission. Yeah. It's risky. Yeah. Do you think there is anything heretical being taught in some of the small groups of Fellowship Bible Church? For well, sure. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. 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 And it's a quality control um, risk that you have to take if you're wanting to have this model of ministry. So what you do is you keep your ear to the ground. You listen to any of the complaints that surface. You investigate and talk with your leaders. And then you correct things. And then when you find that there's a leader that's out there that consistently is inappropriate or inaccurate or whatever... You off-ramp them. And you probably are going to off-ramp 10 to 15% of them a year. So you'll have a 10 to 15% failure rate. Off-ramp, you're saying... Hey, this isn't for you. Yeah. And a lot of times, the only question I ever have to ask a small group leader is, how's it going? And they're like, I don't like this. Like, hey, man, why don't you just be a... Let's find a different spot for you. We don't have to tell them. They don't have to tell us. They know. The problem is you go, how's it going? They're like this is my calling. And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> and you have to tell them. So. But you do it. You do it. Or you, you offer more equipping. My, one of my mentors, Steve Graves, says empowerment, so that's what we're talking about, releasing is empowerment, is the delicate art of knowing when to let go and when to take control. So releasing doesn't mean that we have one leader training in the fall and say, see you later, see you at celebration or see you at Easter. No, it's it's, um, ongoing. So I'm a community pastor in Springdale and I only have nine groups. So I've got nine duos, two couples in each group. I've got 18 men, 18 women. And I just have a cycle of calls and lunches and breakfasts where I sit down and go, how's it going in your group? Sometimes I've already heard. Because somebody I bumped into at Walmart and I go, how's y'all's group going? We haven't met in four weeks. So I'll call the leader, how's it going? Yeah, we're, we're having some inconsistency. And I'm like, hey, do you have a schedule? 
Have you thought about just scheduling it out? Have you emailed it to them? Do you do you send out an email on Friday before the Sunday meeting? You know, coach them. And sometimes I just realize this person's not at a place in life where they need to be leading. They're organizationally a mess, and we have to change things. Sometimes we have to sit down with a college student and say, "Hey, you're not living a life that's worthy of being a cell group leader for FSM right now. We need you to take a time out." You go work on you, and that's we're going to call Kennedy, and we're going to call Josh, college ministry. They're going to come alongside of you. We are not abandoning you, but you just don't need to be a leader right now. You need to take a break. You, um, you, you join take care of that? No, that? we let the, the staff team member. So I would say as residents, you're probably not going to be called upon to do that. But like in our model for you, Jack, that would be Hunter, Kyle, Amy, Abby, Tori, Those or Caleb. Days. Yeah, the, the regional staff. Another, that's what they're called too. Um, Caleb is the team leader for FSM Rogers. Hunter is team leader for FSM Bentonville. Um, Scott is team leader for Mosaic Student Ministry. Tad is team leader for FSM Faithful. So I would say that the dismissal or sidelining of a college student leader would be any of our staff will do that. It would never be a volunteer that would. That wouldn't be a team leader function. The team leader would be the one coming alongside a staff person who needs some in- correction or encouragement or will come alongside of you. You're probably going to get corrected this year. We had a resident run a golf cart through a plate glass window one year, jacking around. And, you know, we had to sit down and talk about that a little bit. Uh, but <laughs> you're probably going to, you're probably going to, do something they're like hey let's don't do that that's part of the residency I still have that said to me sometimes <laughs> yeah Kennedy's father-in-law made it a hobby <laughs> <laughs> you're not your father-in-law you're, you're, your grandpa made it a hobby correcting me it's awesome miss it kidding <laughs> um, <laughs> hey other questions are there's some risk here you overmanage the risk by equipping by staying tight with your leaders. And if you've been in the the fellowship system, you've seen this happen for you. Dave attached himself to you. Tad attached himself to you. Um, Beth Davies told you to take off your hat. (laughs) Didn't she? Uh, You know, all... Yeah, Yeah, she's like, Isaiah, quit with the bucket hat. It was the funniest thing ever. (laughs) It was so funny. I was like... I, I'd like sense it in the morning. I like put the hat on and I was like, you know, we're about to see what I was on this morning. So I just let it ride. So I was, I was unsurprised. Whenever I was told. Was yeah. No big deal. Mm-hmm. No big deal. Um, <laughs> other questions about priesthood of the believer? Jack. Sorry. It's okay. There's think, no minimum on questions. Yeah. Or maximum think, do you think with most churches, this is probably where they go wrong because they put so much weight on their pastoral staff? Like, for example, in Stillwater, I went to a church called uh, Countryside Baptist, and there was like uh, a main uh, you know, main pastor, head pastor, and then like a equipping pastor, and it was really about it. And all the weight was on, like, he preached every week. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it's a right or wrong thing, Jack. It's a philosophical choice of ours that we passionately believe in. So are there some downsides to the upside down triangle with all the pressure on those two guys? Yeah, but there's also some upsides. They, they have a really tight doctrine. There's not anybody out there teaching something that's errant, unless they're errant. Um, they probably have a high degree of professional skill brought to each discipline because they're not sharing those disciplines um, and that kind of thing. And so so we've got some risks that are out there that they aren't assuming. And so there's some benefits to them there. But so it's not right or wrong, but I do think this is why some churches can't grow. Because the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And if you're not producing laborers, then you're not going to reap the harvest. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess my, my question was kind of in conjunction. Like, if, if, if you have that model where it's like you have smaller staff members that are then trying to release leaders, like the multiplication doesn't really work. 
So do you find do you find like in, in this model, like you, you need to as an individual, you need to produce few, but they're also going to produce their few, which then works way better. But I guess what what do you do? What do you do in the in the times like I, this year? This year was really difficult in a lot of ways uh, operating the church. Like when that production sometimes seems to get almost like runs into like a stalemate. Because yeah, this year is yeah. Yeah, I, I think that this is the kind of thing that's like a snowball that builds momentum and picks up weight and velocity as it goes down the hill. And so to a small church staff, I would tell them that, man, this is going to be labor intensive on the front end, but it's going to build and grow. Like we are still, we still have laborers engaged in ministry that were laboring here when I was 22 years old. So a good example of Fellowship Fable, Isaiah, would be Hank Matthews. Mm -hmm. So Hank Matthews was leading community groups and was an elder at Fellowship when I was 22 in 1994. And he's still laboring. Mm -hmm. And he's still a go-to. So the investment that was made in his life by our staff in 93, 92 to 98, like he doesn't have anybody meeting with him weekly now. Um, but think of the payoff, the, the ROI on the time invested. So for a small staff, it's going to take a little time. But you kind of look at FSM Rogers, if y'all are familiar. We have some kind of legends, like one's named Elmo, um, Blake Emerson. We invested in Blake when he was a high school student. Um, and he's been making disciples now since he was a senior in high school. And he's a coach out at Gravit and a football coach at Gravit. So, I mean, he's probably seven years into making disciples. I had pizza with him the other night just to encourage him. And, and uh, he's taking a new job next year. Why? To be closer to guys he disciples because the drive from Gravit's killing his appointments. So he's going to move back to Springdale so he can be closer to his guys. Ryan Brazil, if you all know Ryan from Camp War Eagle. Uh, we reached Ryan when he was in elementary school at Fellowship. He's a lifelong laborer and will make disciples. Anne Defani at Fellowship Fayetteville. John Flowers from Fellowship Fayetteville. Jeff and Wendy Martin. I mean, you, 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 a laborer is worth their weight in gold, but it is labor intensive to get it going. Hey, uh, 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 another thing here is there are some minimum requirements. So we don't just go grab someone who's, you know, still, still on the medical marijuana and and uh, going having an affair and it's like, hey, yeah, lead a small group for us. Um, there are some standards, and I don't know what the standard is, and we don't have it dialed in on paper. It's a it's a judgment call that's subjective with the pastor. Sometimes we've made we've put someone into leadership too early. Sometimes too late, but I like to be on, on the scale of, of too late, too early. I like to be over here because I actually believe that leadership is the tension that makes you mature. It's not the qualification that enables you. Maturity is not the qualification that enables you to lead. And so one of the cool things about you guys being in the residency is we told you we're going to treat you as peers on staff and we expect you to behave like it. So if you start acting like college students again, we're going to call you out on it and say, no, you actually, our, our people out there, when you put that name badge on, they don't know that you're not, we didn't hire you, and you're not a, a licensed minister at fellowship. So you need to act like it. And that would mean showing up to class or showering every once in a while or um, uh, behaving well as you're dating or socializing or that kind of thing. And so uh, three years ago, some of our residents had a bachelor party and they ended up in my office. And I'm not a teetotaler. Fellowship's not a teetotaling congregation. But we actually had someone come and say they felt like it crossed the line on how many beers they drank and the way they were acting. And I just told them, you're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Act like it. So don't end up in my office. That's not fun. I take everything that Gary Harrell taught me and I double it. Yeah. Um, so, from your experience of being in this, this 
referral, kind of like you talked about the correction process. Mm -hmm. Correct people. Um, to what extent? Uh, I don't know. Just like that's that's hard. That's hard to correct people. When, like when they receive that negatively. Um, from your experience, like how do you deal with that? Um, so are you specifically talking about maybe when we have to set a leader in timeout or dismiss them or a staff person that we're just kind of going, quit being a knucklehead? Maybe, maybe like a leader, but they disagree with the conclusion that you've come to. Yeah, that's a great question. We have people that are mad at us. And as my mentor, Robert Cup said, welcome to the ministry. You're always going to have people who think more of you than they should. And you're always going to have people who are mad at you rightly because you messed up or wrongly because they disagree with you or they're immature and welcome to the ministry and don't read your press. You're never as good or as bad as they say, and your identity is found in the Lord. And so, you know, I kind of check my spirit and if, if, like, I'll give you a, uh, well, I should, probably shouldn't use that example. Um, we have had college students that we've set on the sidelines that we've had parents come to us and say, you're doing that is hurting them. Mm -hmm. And why did you do that? Are you being legalistic? To which we have to say leadership's a privilege. Membership is a right. So anybody's welcome to come to fellowship. There are a dozen who aren't. <laughs> we actually have a list of people who are banned from fellowship legally because mm -hmm. they've done some stuff, um, threatened people or threatened us. Um, but other than those 12 people that are on the list right now, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not, being, I'm not joking. Um, we have 12 <laughs> people right now. You can get, the list gets emailed out to the whole staff, so you'll get the list. So these are people like one guy, called in a bomb threat to fellowship and another guy threatened a woman. Uh, we have some people who have child um, sexual offenses who haven't registered properly, who can't come here, all that stuff. Um, everybody's welcome to come here, but not everybody gets to be a leader. And you guys just signed a covenant, didn't you? Did you read it? Because that's what we set in front of somebody. And we say, hey, see this one right here? It says specifically that we're, we're going to do this. And so it's pretty rare that somebody would be upset with us for setting them aside um, because they know, because they're probably a pretty mature person because we ask them to be in leadership. So they know. But occasionally we get some disagreements and occasionally people leave. And occasionally people's family members get upset and that's just part of it. And part of being in the ministry is you have to have a little bit of a tough exterior because when you step on the platform like like Matthew did last Sunday, um, every kid in that room now doesn't really, they don't understand what a resident is. They don't understand what an intern is. And since we team staff and team teach, they're just like, oh, Matthew got hired by the church. He's a preacher now. You're going to be criticized and critiqued more, more um, judgmentally now. Welcome to the ministry. You know, and so that's part of it. You got to have a little tough exterior. Let's keep going. All right. So second, second big principle. And like I said, don't get nervous about the time. Um, if I were going to teach the class and only do one of them, I would have done the first one. Form and function. So in our philosophy of ministry, as we're, we're lifting the hood on this, we distinguish between form and function. Um, let, me, let me explain what that means. A function is a biblical responsibility. Here's, here's a list of six of them. Um, some people only have five. These are the things that the New Testament says a church has to do. If you don't do them, you're not a healthy church. So I'll use the non-E words. Worship. So think about a church that says, no, we don't worship. What would y'all think about that church? Crazy. I mean, we're called or outreach or evangelism. Discipleship. Training or equipping, that's the one that not everybody has. They would lump discipleship and training together. Um, fellowship, which would be the care part, the friendship part, the love one another part, and then service. 
If you don't do these things, you're not a healthy church. Here's the question. How do you do them? How do you do them? How do you worship? Full band? Pipe organ? Bluegrass? <laughs> How do you disciple? How do you evangelize? Large evangelism events? Knock on doors, door to door? Meet people at a coffee shop? Through the context of small groups? Um, how do you do proper care? How do you how do you serve the needy? Does that make sense? Form and function. I won't work through this passage, but First Corinthians chapter nine, Paul is writing about the function of evangelism. He says, "I want to try to win as many people as possible," and then he talks about. Form To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To the Gentiles, I became like a Gentile. So under the function of evangelism, I changed my form for my different audiences. Do y'all see that? Look at the last line. Um, I have become all things, that's form, so that by all possible means, that's form, I might save some, that's function. So what Paul was saying is, man, form is negotiable. Function is is not. We don't get to choose whether we win people to Christ. We do get to choose how we win people to Christ. And so here'd be a good chart. Um, form and function. Function is timeless where form is timely. So uh, the functions, they're static. They don't change while over here, the forms are flexible. Uh, change is actually a, a commodity on this side. It's, it's something that's encouraged. Um, this speaks to method that speaks to mission. So, so here's, here's how this fleshes out at fellowship. Change is something that we want to um, leverage for effectiveness over time. So we're undergoing intense change right now at fellowship. We're moving to a different model. We, our model five years ago was let's build a 4,000 seat auditorium with image magnification screens and let's have a rock concert every Sunday and have people from all four corners of Northwest Arkansas come here and build a parking garage and that whole thing. And, and that was the form and we were headed there. And then we started saying, no, 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 no. That, that's contrary to releasing. We need to go to the people. Don't ask the people to come to us. Let's go campus strategy. Well, where's the furthest point people drive from? East Fayetteville. So our first campus will be in Fayetteville. And then a family came and said, here's a $2 million piece of land. We were like, we feel the Lord's leading. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in a swamp. Yeah. <laughs> Literally in a swamp. They gave us like Shrek's backyard. <laughs> and uh, then the rock company that we needed to get the rock. The rock we were trying to buy was um, the rock somebody else was trying to buy um, was blocked by all this crumbled rock. So they needed to dig all this rock out. So they called us and said, we were trying to buy red clay from them. And they said, hey, we'll sell you all this rock for the same price as the red clay. We need to get it out of here so we can get to this stuff. And they raised Fellowship Fayetteville out of the swamp with three foot of rock. So if you drive onto the campus, if you look to your right and left, you'll see it goes right downhill. We're actually built on a platform which the Lord provided first campus. Second campus, if you'll drive north on I-49, look to your left. Right before you get to the Bella Vista exits, you'll see Fellowship Bentonville. It's all pink right now because of that the stuff they put before they put the rock on, and uh, we'll open in February. Change. Change. And it's going to change here. We're going to have empty 2,000 square foot rooms. Like right now, we have student center centrals rarely ever used for anything. But we're going to have empty rooms, and then we're going to re-strategize our team on what to do with them and how to serve the community with them. Soon, Samaritan Center will be right back here. We've given them land, and they're moving from 102 over to here. We're having a farm. We have a farm now out here. We give away free food. 
to change. Just different forms of doing ministry. Do you all understand this one? Um, questions on form and function. So when fellowship started back in 1983, the original family sat down with the, with the functions on this side of the page and then asked, what's the best form to do this in? Well, we didn't have a building. We didn't have any money. So they asked this crazy question, would it be okay to meet in a school? Now, does that seem odd today? How many of you know of churches that meet in strip mall schools? We were the first ones to do that. Then the question was, when we built this first building, which is the family center, is it okay not to have pews? <laughs> <laughs> is it okay not to have hymnals? We used to actually use a slide projector, which you'll probably don't know what that is, <laughs> where we literally made the song on slides mm -hmm. and then somebody would you know go shh, shh. Yeah. <laughs> nice mm -hmm. shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> but we did that instead of buying handles and it was cheaper that was the driving factor it was cheaper and you could always update it um, Robert used to teach with an overhead projector and right on <laughs> right on the right on the thing that was radical back then so so the danger the danger here would be that you try to change for change's sake. Like cultural relevancy becomes a higher value than biblical accuracy. And you've probably been to a church that's trying too hard. You walk in and either everybody's vaping or they've got the hazer up too loud and, and their room's full of smoke and you're like, I'm at a bar. You know, or, the, or you look up there and the, the pastor, you know he's going to have to be cut out of his jeans after the service. Oh, I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm talking about Dave. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the worship guys. Yeah. So, you know, there are those churches that probably one of their top values is being hip or being culturally cutting edge. Um, as opposed to being just effective, I would say that that fellowship has an understated, understated cultural relevancy. Our goal is not for somebody to walk in and go, wow, these guys are cool. We just want you to see Jesus and we want to get out of the way. And so we could probably be a little more culturally relevant, but nobody's going to accuse us of trying too hard. So um, um, I think that resistance to change could be a hindrance. Somebody says, we're not going to do that because this is the way we've always done it. Um, I think the big thing is distinguishing between what are functions and what are forms, what are doctrines, and what are preferences. So right now, you got to be really careful that you don't take a doctrinal issue like marriage and make it a relevancy issue. Y'all see how we could get into danger there? Because the culture is calling for change in the church's marriage policy and who we marry. And to change that would be to compromise the scriptures. Now, what about changing how we do weddings? Do you see the difference? We don't even have weddings. Where did you get married? Kindred Barn. This is the, one of the founding pastor's granddaughter, and she didn't get married in the church. Fellowship rarely has a wedding at the church. All of our kids get married in barns or <laughs> mostly barns. <laughs> I'll just stay there. When's the last time you went to a wedding that wasn't a barn? There's that new place in Osage Creeks, but it's kind of a barn. <laughs> um, my son got married at Osage Creek. Um, and so, so, but there's a difference in the form of the wedding and who you're going to marry and what your standards are for marrying. See the difference? So we've got to be really careful to distinguish between biblical fidelity and cultural relevance. So we want to be culturally relevant. We want to change. Fellowship should be a different church 10 years from now than it is right now. And maybe some of you will be around here long enough to make some of that change. It's radically different than it was 10 years ago right now. Radically different. Um, and I've gotten to be right in the center of all that change and that I was no gray hair before it all started. Um, and then 10 years from now, I'll be gone. I'll be gone. I'll be like Gary out on the farm rubbing Ann's feet. Um, <laughs> inside joke. And uh, uh, I'll be like Robert. Who's that 
weird guy in the library. Um, and somebody else will be making the change decisions. But if they try to change the Bible, they'll hear from me. Just like I told, I had lunch with Robert the other day, and I said, any assignments for me for, for my last third of my career? He said, don't let them change our theology with misty eyes. And I took it as a challenge. Took it as a challenge. Um, thoughts on form and function? Are low-cut Vs okay? I don't know. All right, this one's real quick. Um, this would be one, something that's under the hood that's kind of floated around here for a long time. Three essential elements of ministry. We talk about TRA, truth, relationships, and accountability. Um, every... Every element of ministry, whether it's, I think, a small group or a large group or an event, needs to have these things flowing through it. So you, you can't have a Christian something without there being it based on truth. Secondly, um, relationships. The, the, the Holy Spirit travels the road of relationships. The church is a communal exercise. We're a team. We don't operate in um, isolation. And so there's got to be a relational element to it. And then thirdly, there needs to be some sort of standard or accountability. This isn't a free-for-all. We don't just talk about truth. We try to live it out. So let's do some math. What if you had a church that had truth and relationships, but no accountability? What kind of church is that? And don't name a denomination, please. I've had that happen. <laughs> let's call it a country club church. Hey, we want to talk a little bit about Jesus and hang out together, but nobody has to do anything about it. Let's don't step on anybody's toes. What about this one? Truth and accountability, but no relationships. What do we call that? There's actually a word. Yeah, close. Starts with legal and ends in ism. What is that word? Legalism. Yes, good. Legalistic church. Dogmatic would be good, Matthew. Yeah. Super quick. What do you mean by country club church? Yeah, just kind of like, hey, we're all hanging out and having a good conversation about that guy, Jesus. But we're not going to hold you to any standards. No accountability. Like, like you could probably think of some denominations um, where, where their doctrinal statement's probably pretty accurate. But you kind of look at maybe the average people that go there and you're like, they don't live that. And do, do their pastors ever preach against that or do they ever talk to them about that? No. It's just kind of like, come if you want to, don't if you don't, do what you want. We're not going to say anything. So no look, no, no see, no talk. Um, I, what about this one? Accountability and relationships, but no truth. What do we call these things? Sometimes they even live behind a wall. A cult. By definition, a cult is a highly communal community that has um, high accountability. Sometimes they don't let you leave it. But they have no truth. They're heretics. So that's a cult. So that's why truth and relationships come. Can you see how those bring some balance? Um, so... You can even think through some of the things you're doing in your ministry this summer and, and use this as a grid for eval. Say, where are we where are we low on? And you may go, man, we, we're kind of a country club group. Or, you know, this kind of feels legalistic. I'm, I'm good at holding to the standard and I'm good at teaching the standard, but we don't hang out very much. Um, there are some parachurch ministries down at U of A that get accused of that a lot. Um, or... Are you um, uh, missing truth, but you're highly communal and accountable? Probably won't happen around here. Uh, last one. Um, fellowship is a decentralized ministry. So that means that, that our ultimate goal is not answering the question, how do we get them here? That's what most ministries ask. How can we attract them to come here so they can hear us preach or experience what we do? That's the question they ask about children's ministry. It's the question they ask about student ministry. It's the question they ask about adult ministry. Therefore, the volunteers are used 
to host and recruit them to get here, and then the pastors do all the work, lead the services, minister, that kind of thing. So this, the centralized ministry, these are the churches that have events. Student ministry is an event. Evangelism is an event. Um, marriage conference, men's conference, women's conference, vacation Bible school, missions conference. You see the theme? How do we get them to come here? Who can we bring? What can we give away? What can we buy? What can we do to get them to come here? Um, fellowship is the, the opposite of that. We do okay on our event. So we try to have a minimal number of events, and one of them is our weekend services. So we, we put some time into doing those well, but we don't bank everything on it. That's why we don't spend all the budget on it. That's why there is a limit to what we'll do because we don't want to spend the time, energy, emotion, or money on it. Um, and so we do okay. We do okay on our events. You'll come to our worship services and, and you'll say, that was good. But we spend everything on the opposite, going to them. That's why we have so many staff because we have so many staff because they're recruiting so many leaders to train and equip them to go out there. And so we're more likely to encounter a new person in their neighborhood or at the lunch table of their junior high than we are having them come in our front door of our foyer. We're decentralized. That's why we don't have a gym or a bowling alley or a cafe. We don't want you eating here, playing ball here or bowling here. Bowl there where they're at. If you want to play basketball, play basketball at the playground at Woodland where there are people who never would come to a church and meet them as you foul them or whatever you're doing. Um, and so we, we tend to not have very many events here. Has anybody ever been to a concert at Fellowship? No. Anybody ever been to a men's, con a men's event here? Any kind of event here outside of one student ministry event a year. <laughs> because when you ask people to come here, it takes weeks to get all those volunteers. You know, if you go to these other churches' events, they all have lanyards. They've been having trainings. They've been recruiting. All that time it takes pulls everybody out of the trenches. And we want them out in the trenches doing ministry. So this goes back to priesthood of the believer. It goes back to Michael, small groups. It goes back to Mark, produce and release. And so by our very mission and by our philosophy of ministry, we tend to not put all of our money in facilities and events. We put it into people. Does that make sense? All right. We have six minutes left. Yes? With this one, like... How did you come up with, or who came up with, like, that's a better way to do it? I've just never heard of that. And most East Texas churches have the gym and the bowling alley oh, and yeah. the conferences. Yeah, my wife, my wife travels and speaks. We've been to all of them in Texas. Seems like that's her hotbed. Yeah. So we went to Prestonwood in Dallas, mm -hmm. and they had a meal for this women's ministry event and fed a 1,000 people. And I was talking to the pastor's wife, who's awesome, by the way. It's really funny. I was talking to her, and I realized later she was the pastor's wife of this big dog pastor. What's his name? Paige Patterson or something. And uh, she was running the bookstore. She's a really humble lady. But she goes, well, we have a chef and a culinary team. So on their staff, they have a restaurant team for how many events they have. And every Sunday, that whole dining area serves Sunday lunch at a cost to everybody. So they have their own, I guess, lubies. If y'all have ever seen one of those yeah. lubies. They have their own lubies in the church. Yeah. Um, who came up with it? I think that all of this has evolved over time. Um, but most of it is done in reaction. So, so um, for instance, um, form and function was actually, it's literally ripped right out of this book called Resharpening the Focus of the Church, which was written in the late 70s. And it, it was a part of the Dallas theological ecclesiology class that Robert Cup, Robert Lewis, all these guys were taking way back in the early 80s. So, but for us, Robert, Gary, Mickey all came out of Southern Baptist background. So they're sitting there the Monday after their big youth event where they've worked six weeks 
bringing in all this stuff, and I don't know what they did, but what what we did, you know, you get inflatables, you get a band, you give away an Xbox, you you know, do the sledgehammers on the car or whatever, whatever to get kids out there, free pizza. Um, <laughs> and then you're sitting there on Monday, and you're exhausted, and you don't know any kids' names. And, and you know you don't know any kids' names because what you have on your desk is a stack of decision cards that they filled out because nobody was there to talk to them. So you had to give them a card to say what's going on in your life. And you, you start praying through those cards. And over time, I think they were just like, man, there's got to be a better way. Mm-hmm. The small groups movement started in the 80s out of Dallas, and it was just a complete flip-flop. This priesthood of the believer thing um, was a complete flip-flop. So the home church movement is now 35 years old. And uh, so there's lots of home churches, home church groups now. We call them community groups or cell groups. Um, I don't know very many churches that do it in student ministry. So the reason we did it when I got here, we were running events. Mm -hmm. and, And fellowship had gone from a, a Bentonville church plant with seven families to a Benton County church. And then all these people started driving from Fayetteville because of UBC connections. And we were trying to figure out what do you do with a football player who gets out of practice at 645 and we had our youth ministry event starting at 630. He, he's not coming. And the cheer team in upper Bentonville is not, what do we do? So we said, let's quit having youth events at the church. Let's go to them. So we started home groups. Why not do that? Let's just do that. And it worked. And it's always worked. So some of this stuff just evolved over time. But, but the form and function and the priesthood of the believer, I think, kind of came out of a theology class at Dallas Theological Seminary. And then we just honed it down over time to where we can communicate it. Mm-hmm. We got time for one more question. This is interesting. You can say no if it's not. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, yeah. Well, I would say that fellowship feels comfortable in our own skin. Don't view that as arrogance. I don't think we do it the best. I don't think other people do it wrong. This isn't philosophy of ministry is not right or wrong. But we feel really comfortable with who we are and where we're going enough that these things would cause us to have an easy no on some things. No, we don't do that. No, that isn't who we are. Um, and so, so this is who we are, and we know who we are and, and how we're going to do things, and so you're going to get to experience it. You may find yourself going, man, I don't like this. And it's just telling you that you probably have a different engine under the hood you need to attach yourself to. It doesn't mean we're wrong or that what you like is right. Um, or you may find yourself going, what? This is my jam. Yeah. And that's the way I felt the first time I came here. I thought, okay, that's how you do church. And that's why I've never left. And I've had plenty of opportunities to do other things. I just really like it here. And I like the way we do things. And, and 10 years from now, it'll, it'll, it will evolve some. And we'll, we'll keep changing it and morphing it. So. Hey, let me pray over you guys. Well, Lord, um, thanks for bringing each one of these residents here and those who aren't here. I know Ty is not here and others. Um, So I pray over their year before them and pray just over their personal lives, um, their soul, their friendships, their dating lives, um, that you would just take care of them while they're here, some of them far away from friends and family. And Lord, I pray that this year you would wear them out physically, emotionally, spiritually, and give them a taste of what it's like to serve you with everything they've got. And Lord, I pray that you would affirm their gifts, help them to discover their passions and what they're good at, and that you would lay something on their heart for their next step in life and open that door. So Lord, I pray for this to be a fruitful year, and we give it to you and thank you for each one who's willing to give a year to serve. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take the extra food. Take the waters. Thanks for hanging out with me. It's a privilege to have you guys here. I am available to you if you need me. Thank you. You're welcome. So cool. It's like both. You are both. It's a revolt. It was great. Did you hear that?